shifting from right to left. Play action to that side. Rolling right, looking. Fires in the end zone. Got a man. Oh, touchdown. That's a tight end from 15 yards out. Welcome to the Bowl Season Stories Podcast, Season 3, Episode 2. I'm Nick Carparelli, the Executive Director of Bowl Season, and today we are joined by the National College Football Insider for the Athletic, Bruce Feldman, and Head Football Coach of the LSU Tigers, Brian Kelly. If you missed any of our previous episodes, you can catch them on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, or anywhere else you listen to your podcasts. And if you enjoyed today's show, we'd appreciate you to like, subscribe, and drop a five-star rating. And as always, you can follow all the Bowl Season news on our website, bowlseason.com, and on social media at Bowl Season. Today's show is brought to you by Sport Radar, reimagining immersive experiences for sports fans and betters. Our first guest has been a national college football insider for the athletics since 2018, after spending 17 years at ESPN and two years at CBS Sports. He currently lends his voice to Fox as a studio analyst and a sideline reporter for college football. He's published numerous books. Please welcome to the show, Bruce Feldman. Bruce, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Nick. Excited to be here. Can't believe college football season is right around the corner here. You've been covering uh, the sport for the last 20 years uh, or more. One subsection that has really caught your attention is the uh, that of the quarterback position, uh, so much so that you wrote a whole book about it. What is your take on the rising star of the quarterback position and what it means to be a college FBS quarterback in 2023? Yeah, it's been a fascinating evolution. When I did that book, it was almost 10 years ago. And it really, what I started to to notice a lot was that the private quarterback coach space had just exploded, especially it started here. I'm based in Southern California. And initially that's where with Steve Clarkson, it really took off. Um, but now it's everywhere. And the technology and the attention to detail is really quite remarkable. Um, and so we see it with, you know, almost every quarterback quote has a guy or so. Um, and I think it's been fascinating to see how the position has changed. I mean, back when I started working on that book, um, you know, Aaron Rodgers was pretty much everyone, every young quarterbacks guy at that point. That was the one they, you know, now it's, it's more Patrick Mahomes. Um, and I think how they play the game where it is one of these things where you see some shortstop and second baseman in them. You see some point guard in them. You see the 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 kind of cross section of all the sports that that let you play off p- platform and do some of these amazing things that we see quarterbacks do. And whether it's in Caleb Williams, who just won the Heisman last year, or you know, as I said, Mahomes or, or you know, any one of these other guys. Now, which I think is really cool is you know, back and Nick, you and I are roughly the same age, but like for so long, the prototype was guys who were, um, you know, of that six, four two twenty kind of range. And now we're seeing guys who, I mean, look who the, the first pick of the draft, Bryce young, he's under six feet. He's not a big guy, but he won a Heisman and was a fantastic college player. And so we're seeing a lot smaller, you know, different size guys and everything else. And I think that's been really, really cool to see how that game how this game has evolved yeah and that position certainly has evolved over the years you're you're, you're right I mean the, you just look at a an NFL quarterback nowadays it's it, it, they look very different than they did in the past as you pointed out let's talk about your uh, college football freaks list uh, and all the incredible work you've done that's one of the things maybe most closely associated with your name it's been with you almost your whole career share with us the concept of the freaks list uh freaks list and and a little uh, about the 2023 edition, which dropped last week, a true freshman, uh, Nicholas Harbor from uh, Archbishop Carroll High School in D.C. and now at the University of South Carolina. Yeah, it started almost 20 years ago and I was at ESPN and I was they had my at the time myself and Buster Olney, who was our baseball writer. Um, we were we were there asked to do blogs at the time to go all year. And for baseball, and especially the the season is much longer. There's obviously spring training, and it's it's you know it extends the whole year, whether it's off season, you know, signings and everything. For me, college football at that time, unless it was like bad news, was really not much to write about in the dead of the off season. But one of the things I was like, you know, intrigued by was a bunch of schools always had some guy who was like the guy everybody buzzed about. He could vertical jump 44 inches or bench pressed two and a quarter, 42 times or some kind of thing that like they were just, he was their freak. And so 
I thought about it. Let me find like the 10 biggest freaks in college football. And that was how it started. And then over time, it has grown and grown. I mean, I had 100 this year. We had 101. Um, and where it really, I think, started to take off was in the, maybe the last seven or eight years. You mentioned I, I've been a sideline reporter for Fox. And before the games, two hours before when the teams are warming up, you know, I, I'm down there uh, trying to get everything I can, the most up-to-date information leading into kickoff, but also uh, the NFL scouts are all down there. And so I had a bunch of scouts who would introduce themselves and talk to me about the freaks list. And it really grew from that because then all of a sudden I realized these guys are a great resource for this. I was really leaning heavily on the strength coaches around the country and some other coaches I knew, but for the most part, it was that. Now I, that's still the bread and butter of this, but once I started getting into, it's not just the guys who are at the big name schools, but then it was like group of five programs as well as FCS division two. I had a division three player um, this year as well. And so it, I felt like it became something where it was a great way to kick off the season to get people fired up. Um, and also, I just think it's a great way to spotlight a bunch of a bunch of programs that maybe people aren't paying attention to. And so all these people who are diehard NFL draft fans who may not be big college football fans, but they want to know the guys way ahead of time. And this is a great window into finding out who might light up the combine or who's going to, you know, dazzle people at a pro day. will have some buzz, you know, probably seven or eight months from now. I want to talk about your outward stance on the importance of bowl games. And I think it was in 2021, you tweeted a video of, of Dak Joyner uh, from South Carolina post game. The video was very emotional and, and mind you, South Carolina finished six and six that year, which was a which was a big step forward for them. They they beat North Carolina in the Duke's Mayo Bowl uh, to go seven and six. He was very emotional. You posted that video with the with the quote uh, or your statement was "Love this reason number forty three thousand nine and why there actually are not too many bowl games." Uh, why is your stance on the what is your stance on the role of bowls play in college football? And explain to our listeners why there in fact are not too many bowl games. Because if you're a college football fan, you want, you'll love it and you won't get it a month later. They're going to be gone. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this. And, you know, like I'm getting, you know, probably five different things are popping into my head at once. And I'm gonna, maybe I'm going to work backwards. But what I love, one of the things I love about bowl games is, you know, last year I'm watching the New Mexico State quarterback who, I'll be honest, I had not seen at all the, you know, in the previous three months of the season. And you kind of have an element of discovery with a lot of people who are off the radar because for that night, um, you know, it could be December 23rd. It could be, you know, whatever. It's sometime that's usually not around the New Year's Day games. It's earlier. And we all get to, you know, if we're real football fans or, you know, we're diehard college football fans, you get to see these guys. They get the stage. And I think it's a really cool element of that. And I remember as a little kid, um, and I don't know if you're going to remember this, but I feel like we're in the same, you know, like I know we're the same age. Like when I was a kid, I remember before, you know, before Christmas, I would just be so like excited if I'd see there was a bowl game that was going to be on this random night of the week. You know, it was like the Ms. Lou TV network and they would put out whoever it was. I don't know if it was the Blue Bonnet Bowl or some you know, seemingly random bowl game to me as like an eight year old, but I thought it was the coolest thing ever because, you know, again, growing up in that era, we got football on, on Saturday and Sunday. And that was it, you know, back in my early days at ESPN, I can remember Virginia tech being one of those schools who were playing on Thursday nights, but you know, like I love the midweek Mac games. I love, you know, as much football as I can get. So the idea that we're getting these bowl matchups and you can see, as you said, a six and six team, it means a lot because a lot of those teams, they are not, I don't want to say spoiled by it, but like it's still new. Maybe for them getting to a bowl game, if they haven't been to one, I mean, go to talk to somebody on at Chris Creighton's program, what that was like before at, you know, at, at Eastern Michigan, they had not been to, you know, maybe now it's a, it's old hat, but, but for a while when, you know, I, I can go back, it wasn't that long ago, you know, um, Kent State, you know, with uh, Sean Lewis, they have a breakthrough. And that's a really cool moment, you know. And I think that so for me, as somebody who, who covers the sport and still loves it, maybe even more than I ever did, um, the bowl games are an extension of that. 
Yeah, college football so unique, Bruce. I mean, we talk a lot about the fact that, you know, there's, you know, the playoffs going to 12 now. I don't know how much bigger it, it can get. There's only so many games you could ask these student athletes to play after the regular season. There's 133 FBS programs now all at different stages of their development. Some are young programs, some are historic programs that maybe are going through a, a down phase. I, we spoke to uh, Coach Rule about it last week. University of Nebraska, Nebraska hasn't been to a bowl game in six years. You know, they're, 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 you know, to expect them to jump right into the playoff is probably a little unrealistic. They, they want to get to a bowl game, and they're going to celebrate that and be excited about it. Yeah, and I, I think that's a that's a big big deal for those programs in it. And I think it's also a big deal for the fan bases, you know, who get that you know that element of discovery and go on that journey of of what it means for them to get there. I can think of um, something. So growing up in the Northeast, Rutgers football was always pretty shaky, and I knew Greg Schiano when he was the defense coordinator at Miami, and then I was based in New York when he took the Rutgers job, and I remember going out there to see him a couple times. I remember seeing, you know, West Virginia, I think Rich Rod might have put up 80 on him, you know, that first year or second year, and they were in they were in really rough shape, and then it started to build, and I can tell you this, and I'm not somebody, who, you know, other than, like, I, you know, knew some of the guys on the staff, um, they they played in a bowl game in Arizona, and I just remember Brent Musburger was doing the game, and he he did the whole like you are looking live, and it was a, a game involving Rutgers football, and it was a bowl game, and I was like, holy cow, this is like it's kind of surreal to see that, you know, and it was a real thing, and I think for people of that fan base, I mean, it probably blew their minds. Brent Musburger's calling one of our games. It's a you know we have a bowl game. You know, it's not to say that they've never had success before that but just to know where that program had been and then to see it was definitely a big step for them yeah no doubt about it very very memorable experiences for for everybody involved in, in that game to elaborate a little bit more what are what are some of your favorite memories in your career covering bowl games i know you've covered a lot of them you may have gone to some as as, as fans i'm sure it's not easy to choose considering the the number of postseason football games you've witnessed but are, is anything that sticks out in your mind you know, one of the first bowl game, big bowl games I really went to for work was Ohio State played Arizona State, and it was Jake Plummer was at ASU. It was a wild game, came down to the end. I believe I had just moved to Seattle for ESPN, and we had had like the blizzard of whatever it was, 96 in uh, in Seattle, and just to get out of, of there to get to the Rose Bowl was a challenge. Um, and being there was this just, you know, if no one's ever, if you've never been to the Rose Bowl, you have to go because it's just this, the best venue in, in, in college football. And the setting is perfect. The game was great. I mean, I don't know. I'd have to count up how many Roll, Rose Bowls I've covered. I mean, it's got to be close to two dozen now, I think. And um, it, it, that one stood out, but I, there's just so many, even the games where, you know, I like I, I one year because I was working on the QB book and I was really following Johnny Manziel towards his run up to the draft, um, you know, going to the Chick-fil-A Bowl in in Atlanta to see them play Duke and Duke was all over them. The first one was a wild game in the, the way it came back and it was memorable. And it's just like, you know, I can think of all these, you know, going at the seeing. Miami in the national title game against Nebraska and just a, that was the dominant team. Again, it was in the, in the Rose Bowl. I can remember seeing my, you know, now colleague Matt Leiner just light up Oklahoma um, on a rainy night in the Orange Bowl. At least it was raining, I guess, at halftime. But, you know, just you're kind of, you never know what you're getting with the bowl games because it, a lot of times there's like a month gap. And in that case, I don't think anyone expected USC, maybe the USC people did, to dominate Oklahoma like they did. But it's just, um, they're all kind of unique in their own way because I feel like, you know, it's at the end of the season, there's something bigger there. Um, they all kind of like, kind of um, blur together at some point, like in elements of it. Or you also have those moments where, you know, you're covering one game. And then I remember after our game coming back to watch the, the end of Chris Peterson's, you know, wild upset against Oklahoma and how much like I love looking back at that game because there was so much I missed because I was I 
I think I was at the Rose Bowl that day. I didn't even remember where I was, but I remember, you know, seeing it in like a press room, at, you know, as the game was winding down. Yeah, I always say if you're a if you're a college football player and you're on campus for five years, how cool would it be in your career to go to a bowl game in in, in New York City, in Tampa, Florida, in in New Orleans, in Scottsdale, and uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and you get to experience all these really unique communities, uh, places that those those student athletes probably have never been to in their life and might not ever go to again in the future. Yeah, I look. Count me in if you can show me snow at at Yankee Stadium for the Pinstripe Bowl, or you know, I I love to see those. I mean, I can remember watching a three nothing uh, Oregon State pit game. You know, that was just like I think it was. I don't know if the wind. Oh, you know, fun. what's that? I was at the Sun Bowl. I was at. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like? It was super windy and, cold, you know, like I just remembered the guy who this is kind of a combination of the freaks list, the guy who I think still may hold the combine bench press record. Stephen Pia was their nose tackle at Oregon State. And he was pretty dominant. Um, but like, yeah, all all those like it's just like too many to mention because I feel like there is I don't know what it is. I feel like the part of the part of the bowl experience as a as a media person ties into when you first discovered the sport as a fan, as a little kid. And so there's just a nostalgia aspect of it that I think is honestly, it's pretty genuine. Now you've made some statements of your support of the traditional rivalry games. You've covered a, a, your fair share on the big noon kickoff uh, in 2020 and, and recent years as a reporter during the 2019 season. How, how important do you think it is to protect, protect the tradition of rivalry games in rivalry week in college football? I, I hope that can be something that can be saved. I mean, I was like irrationally excited last year for the backyard brawl. You know, it was the first week of the season. And there's something about those games. Again, like I I really, you know, kind of discovered college football in the in the late 70s, but really grew to love it in the 80s. And I just think of it like you know, I know you have, you know, deep Ter Syracuse ties from work there, but like using this example for me, like one of the first elements of sports that I really was like awed by was like the old Big East basketball. Right. And you had, and granted they're playing multiple times a year, but just the idea of the Georgetown, Syracuse, Georgetown, St. John's, Villanova, you had, you had also like kind of these larger than life figures, not just literally in John Thompson, but like Louie and Rolly, you know, and, and Beheim. And, and um, so I think what comes from that is the familiarity of it, right? The fans live it, you know, it's not like, especially in this day and age now, and I'm not against the transfer portal, but there's a lot of, a lot of turnover and, and coaches bounce around a lot more and, and coaches honestly have, have, um, you know, more heat on them to win sooner or they get run out of there. So I just think that the familiarity piece of it is a really cool element because at the end of the day, you know, yeah, the, yeah, the Texas fans, I'm sure they hate Jimbo and I'm sure that the a and fans hate Sark, but it's the school and it's the helmet and it's everything that goes with it. Just like, you know, in the egg bowl, especially, you know, when, when Mike Leach was, was still there, um, you know, I think he and Lane Kiffin, had a probably as good a relationship as you're going to get in terms of the, being those rival schools in the egg bowl, but it's still, we know how the two fan bases feel about each other. And I, I sometimes it get, go boils over, but I think at the end of the day, it's one of the things that's pretty rare. I mean, it's, you know, you still have Yankees, Red Sox and, 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 you know, obviously a lot of other great rivalries and, and, you know, Lakers Celtics and everything, but college is filled with that stuff because it's such a regionalized sport. Well, so this will, that'll serve as a great transition. I want to talk about conference realignment a little bit. I think one of one of the consequences of conference realignment is that many of these rivalries have either gone by the wayside or been minimized. What's your take on all of the conference realignment that's taken place this year and in recent years? And do you think it is good for college athletics in general and for the student athletes specifically? Um, you know, I don't, I think for football, it's probably different than it is for the non-revenue in the Olympic sports, because I think they will, you know, they travel differently. Like I had this conversation with Chip Kelly and he, he's had a lot of people say, well, how are you guys going to deal with the travel? He goes, we charter, you know, we travel on chartered flights and we, we 
we're not going to do it that much, you know, whereas the other sports are, you know, I think it's going to impact them a lot more than it will football. I'm not saying it won't impact football at all, but I think it's a lot tougher ask when your schedule is so many more games and so many more trips and how you travel is different than how football mostly is going to travel. I think it's, it's, it's really sad to see that the, the PAC 12 will not exist as we knew it for so long. Um, you know, and, and so I think that's definitely bittersweet. I really feel for those four programs, um, you know, especially like here's at Washington state and Oregon state. I don't know, you know, do they end up in the mountain West or some version of that? I, I don't know. And, you know, I think that there's, there's still going to be big, great matchups, you know, probably more of them because, to me, Nick, as much as this is conference realignment, it feels like it's conference consolidation. And you're taking the biggest brand schools. I don't know that it's, you know, and I, no one's going to say this. No one who matters is going to say this. But like, is the next step or, or 5.0 of this that the schools that aren't that good, who are in the power, big, big 10 and the pack and the SEC, are there like the bottom of that? Are they going to get squeezed out of this at some point? I mean, no one's going to say they will, but like, it wouldn't shock me. Cause I, I mean, I'd be less surprised to see somebody say, Hey, you know, Vandy is going to get nudged out or Northwestern is going to get nudged out or Indiana or Purdue as like a, a yearly kind of thing. People get relegated down and can move and can move up. Maybe, maybe. I mean, I, I just like the fact that we've seen, you know, if I told you or you told me, 20 years ago that USC and UCLA were going to end up in the big 10. Um, I'd be like, what? Look at a map. That doesn't, that, you know, hey, like, no way. no way. Yeah. And so here we are. So yeah. like, and I don't, I don't hold it against anybody, you know, who's, you know, who's a decision maker or, a, you know, running a conference that they would ultimately, or be told or be asked by the TV networks and full disclosure, obviously I work for one at Fox. Um, whether they are going to make some kind of cutthroat business move because a couple of years ago, I remember I was at big 10 media days. And I was talking to some ADs in the big 12 and one of the ADs I talked to, this was over the course of like a morning, but one of the ADs I talked to was just talking about like how he was totally blindsided about what was going on with Texas and OU leaving. And I was just kind of like, listen to it. I'm like, man, that must, because these are relationships that you really have where there are people that are, you know, in some cases, really good friends and mentors and different things. And to see that kind of, but the truth of it is, and somebody had said this recently about, you know, you know, in terms of how this college sports operates, you know, they're all competitors and these are businesses and people sometimes, oftentimes make business decisions that are totally money driven, ultimately money driven. And then, you know, what happens sometimes a lot of people are not going to like it. They're not, they're not good for everybody, but they're good for them. And, un, you know, fair or unfair, that's just where we're at with all this. Last question for you, Bruce, uh, in May of 2022, you wrote an article about your all time favorite football team. The story of you becoming coach Feldman for your son's PB football squad. I love to know the story of you trading in your, your pen for a whistle to do that. Yeah, it, it was crazy in that um, I didn't want to coach. Like, I didn't mind being an assistant coach. I'd done that before. But all the logistical stuff, like calling around different areas to try to find a place to practice and going through a bunch of stuff, I was like, eh, I don't know if I want to do any of that or whatever. And, but a lot more work than people realize. Yes, yes. I spent a whole day calling like three different, you know, trying to get somebody on the phone from Parks and Rex in three different areas to try to see if I could practice somewhere. I was going in circles. And at one point I came upstairs to talk to my wife and I'm like, I'm just like at wit's end. And eventually we just practiced in a random spot in a park. And then I later found out that like we lost a kid on the team because we were practicing too far away from where they lived. And, you know, it's just whatever. And the draft process, drafting, you know, these are first and first and second graders. And we had a combine and that's what happens. It was, a, you know, it was an NFL flag league. And you know, for people who haven't read the piece, because I, I don't want to go all the way in on every detail because it would be long. But like what was so cool about this was 
the bond that I felt like I had with not just my son, which is obviously the most important thing as a parent, but also with the families and the kids I coached, you know, and it's, and, you know, it's funny is, and, and, you know, Nikki, you have this too with Instagram. There's a lot of people that I know that I feel like I know a lot better because I see how they are with their own kids through sports, whether it's, you know, some of their daughter sports or their son sports. Like I know for, in your own case, you know, from, and your, your kids are older than mine, but certainly, you know, seeing that, like, that's one of the things that connects us as people, you know, I can't tell you how many different people um, I talk to who either really fell for that story and kind of just got just kind of um, road went along for the ride on it. And what's really cool, like I know some coaches who like, I only use my Instagram at this point for just really personal stuff. So I just post stuff about, you know, either stuff around my job on the road or kids sports or kids activities. And so there's an NFL coach who like, we follow each other. He's an assistant and like, he will text me stuff and I'll show my son, Ben, who's now nine. And it'll blow his mind about like, oh my God, this guy who's coaching, you know, these people is, is watch, saw that I had a pick six last week. You know, it's just, um, it's just the coolest thing. And, you know, I, I coach, I'm coaching this fall. Like, I mean, I have to find time to do it. We only can practice, a, you know, in a, either Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, cause I'm away Thursday and Friday and we play in a different league because um, I can only have, you know, coaching games that are on Sundays, but it's, it's the most amazing experience. Um, I am so um, grateful and fortunate that I lucked into having it because if I didn't see that email that said, Hey, we're going to have to drop 30 kids from the league. Cause we don't have, if we don't get two more people to coach, um, you know, I probably never would have made the leap to do it. Well, life is about experiences as, as we learn, Bruce, you know, and that, that might be uh, of all the great things you've done. That might be one of your, one of your better ones. I mean, you talk about experiences and memories, nothing better than with your son. I've, I've, I've experienced that same thing. You know, you, that bond you have with, you know, with your son, but then it becomes your son's friends and then their families and, you know, those kids will remember their time with you for the rest of their lives, whether you realize it or not. Yeah. And it, even towards that point, like, so, you know, I remember we're at the, the Fiesta Bowl event in, um, in Arizona. And so Scott Lightman, who helps put, put that event on, I know his son is a lacrosse player. And so we trade stories. He's, you know, he's, um, you know, a high school player, but it's funny when you hear little different things, even when they're not like, you know, I was telling him about like, you know, my son's notorious for going to a football camp and, and he'll end up playing a little quarterback and he'll lose his right glove. And so he always ends up like every season, we have to buy him a new pair of gloves because he's uh, like somewhere along the way, he will lose stuff. You know, he's a, still a little kid, but then you hear other parents. I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't want to put, I don't want to put Scott's son out there, but he had left a lacrosse glove somewhere. It was like, oh yeah, this still happens. And I, again, I think these are the things that, that really connect us as people is our shared experiences. I mean, that is, that will be my favorite story that I've ever done because of how personal it is to me. And, you know, there's things I never thought about that, that crystallize once I'm in the middle of it. Well, we appreciate your time, Bruce. Uh, you do an amazing job covering the game of football. You're, you're, uh, you're an asset to the sport. Uh, you have a great perspective on, on everything you cover and, and everything you write. So uh, I really appreciate everything you do for the game and uh, really appreciate you joining us today on our podcast. My pleasure. It was great talking to you, Nick. Thanks. All right. Take care. You too. The forecast for this tax season, it's going to rain refunds, lots of refunds. File for less and get more with Tax Act, the official tax filing software of bowl season. Go to taxact.com to get started today. Our next guest is entering his second season with the LSU Tigers and 33rd year overall as a college head football coach. He's led his teams to 14 bowl games in his career. Please welcome to the show, Coach Brian Kelly. Coach, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Coach, we've known each other a while now. I've, I've always found your career path to be interesting. You know, we live in a society of instant gratification. We see a lot of young coaches who they, they start off at the Division I level right away, uh, an analyst, a GA, and, and in their mind, that's that's all they're ever going to know, right? They think they're going to work their way up and 
become a, a division one head coach probably quicker than they should. You, on the other hand, you were an assistant coach for eight years at the division two level. Then you were a head coach at Grand Valley State for 13 years. You finally got your first opportunity to be a division one head coach at Central Michigan in 2004. It's almost like you've had two coaching careers, right? You're, you were at the division two level for 21 years, now 20 years at the division one level. How did coaching at the division two level prepare you for the second half of your career and, and allow you to do what you've done at Cincinnati, Notre Dame, and now at LSU? Well, I think when you're in division two, you have to do less with more and, and you know, or do, do more with less, excuse me. I think, you know, when you talk about the staffs today, you know, I've got uh, over, you know, 20 coaches when you include analysts into that. I I started out at Grand Valley State. I had an offensive coordinator, a defensive coordinator, and a head coach. And so, um, you know, three full-time coaches. Um, you learn to, um, you know, do many jobs. We wore a lot of different hats. Um, I had to do all the academics, uh, assisted with weight training, uh, travel, budget, um, all of those things. So I think it serves you well that you get a chance to know all aspects of the program and you're not just, um, you know, X's and O's. You, you know uh, how to put together a comprehensive, cohesive program. And it serves you well when you get this opportunity in Division One. Now, tell us a little bit about your first bowl experience. It was a little unique. You led Central Michigan to a bowl, but departed for Cincinnati before the game, only to coach the Bearcats in the international bowl just a couple of weeks into the job tell us what, what that was like well that was quite interesting because we uh we actually split the staff um half of the staff stayed behind at central michigan and prepared the football team uh for their bowl game while the other half of the staff came with me to cincinnati uh as you know um I immediately took over that staff at Cincinnati and prepared them for their bowl game, the, which was then uh, the International Bowl uh, in, in Toronto. So unlike uh, some uh, transitions uh, where the head coach is not involved in it, uh, I took over the Cincinnati program. Uh, so uh, I had a number of those coaches also that were at Central Michigan, and we didn't you know, obviously want to leave those guys behind because they had not uh, hired a head football coach yet. So uh, quite, quite unusual where uh, we were kind of balancing two programs at the same time and getting them ready for two bowl games. Uh, so I don't know that that's been done many times if, if, if ever, um, but it was, it was quite interesting. Uh, I think uh, one of the, my first memories of, of, uh, you know, the first night in the hotel uh, in Toronto, I think uh, our players learned uh, how expensive a metropolitan city like Toronto was. Uh, their per diem didn't last very long. Uh, and uh, the rest of the week, uh, it was great. We had no curfew issues because everybody was out of money. So it kind of actually uh, uh, put together, uh, in my own mind, a, a great way to uh, enjoy the bowl season. And that is let them go earlier in the week because uh, by the time you get to Tuesday, Wednesday, they're out of money. Well, those bowl games are such memorable life experience for this, for the players, whether you're in the playoff or, or any other bowl game, every program's at a different point in their development. What has it meant for you and your programs over the years to play in bowl games? Well, first of all, it's, it's an opportunity to uh, really celebrate uh, the season. It's a long season. It's hard. It, it takes so much effort, not only from the players, but everybody associated, the support staff. And, and then, of course, all the families get an opportunity to share in the sacrifices. So I think it's a culmination of, of just all of the sacrifice and the hard work that's put into a season. And you don't really look at, you know, uh, what the records are as much as you've made it to a bowl game. And it's it's the culmination of, uh, of a job well done. So um, I think more than anything else, um, it, it, it has a sense of accomplishment. It has a sense of, um, you know, we did things uh, that allow us to, to celebrate the season. And that's what the bowl games uh, allow all these football programs the opportunity uh, to do. And, and that brings your team together. And so people talk all the time about, well, you know, what does a bowl game do for you? Uh, it brings you closer. It brings you closer as a football program. Um, it allows you to uh, 
build relationships with support staff and, and members of your um, alumni and certainly um, those that you don't have contact with during the season. Uh, the bowl game gives you all of those opportunities that you don't normally have. Well, you mentioned the experiences and the opportunities, you know, 14 bowl games you've been a part of. Obviously, there's game day, which everybody sees. But, you know, teams get to the bowl site, you know, three, four, five days in advance, all kinds of unique opportunities. What are you what are some of your favorite memories uh, with your family, with your staff, with your with your student athletes during during your uh, 14 uh, bowl game experiences? I would say more than anything else is the, the, the chance it slows down a little bit when you get to the bull side, because, you know, you're with them all day, as you know, when you're, you know, on campus, uh, you're in that, you know, 20 hour and, and the 20 hour week, you, you don't have much time. So when, when you get to a bull site, you got them in the morning at breakfast and lunch and dinner and, and, and I think what, what stands out is it, you get to do things that you're not normally allowed to do. Um, I think things that stand out are celebrating Christmas uh, with your team, celebrating New Year's with your team, uh, the opportunity to see them outside uh, of football. You know, they have identities outside of football and, and being able to, to get a glimpse at those, those identities that are outside of football or what make the bowl uh, season so special. Coach, you, you've coached in a few different cultures and environments, two of which are considered some of the most unique in college football in Notre Dame and LSU. Can you describe the atmosphere on a Saturday night in Baton Rouge? I could say if, if I was to just use one word, it's probably uh, electric. And, and so what does that mean? Uh, you could feel it. I mean, it it um, it's palatable. I mean, you um, you walk into that stadium and and there is a feeling of excitement. But yet, I think what makes it different is everybody is locked into the game, um, the focus, uh, the attention to the game itself is like nothing that I've ever experienced, and and that goes from having not just a passionate fan base. Passion is one thing. This is a fan base that is so um, learned about the game that they are focused on every snap. And, and that's quite unusual. And I think that's what makes the atmosphere um, for the visiting team so exhausting because uh, they're in it every single play. Now, the job of a head coach just seems to keep getting tougher and tougher. You know, tell me your thoughts on the changing landscape, specifically the combination of the transfer portal and NIL all at once. It seems harder than ever to build a great culture in a football program, which I know has always been really important to you. How do you manage all that? Well, I think if we're in a vacuum, you know, and we look at um, transfer portal and if we look at NIL, those things are uh at face value by definition, uh, things that we can manage uh, within college football. The problem is that they've gone so far to one side, you know, where name, image, and likeness has brought in unsavory, unsavory characters. There, there is the transfer portal where, you know, there's inducements. And, and so if, if, if we could, you know, get um, our hands around the NIL and make it strictly about uh, your name, your image and likeness and not be about inducements and not be about having different laws for different states and and have a transfer portal that's that's strictly about this is not the right fit for me. Um, then then I think we can manage all those things. The problem is when you, when you put in new laws and new legislation legislation and you don't have great guardrails, um, they sometimes, you know, uh, move in the wrong direction. We've got to get hold of this and and create better uh, rules and regulations. If we do that, I think we can manage it. And then on top of those two things, we have a conference realignment. I'm not sure how much time you spend thinking right. about that. Your job is to coach. But a lot, I know a lot of your coaching colleagues have been pretty outspoken about how this is not all good for the student athlete. What do you think? Well, I mean, look, I mean, it, it's – it's difficult for for anyone to think that um, 
you know, the Rutgers Oregon softball game is, is going to be well attended by anybody from, from Rutgers on Wednesday uh, during the week. I mean, let's face it, this is about football and, and football drives a lot of this. So, um, you know, I, I think all I would say is that, you know, football has created a very difficult spot for all the Olympic sports. And um, we know that that revenue drives a lot of that. And if not all of it, um, is there a way that that this can be looked at uh, without football being um, the piece that that uh, upsets all of it? And And I think that that's what um, smart people uh, above my pay grade are putting all their time and effort to kind of figure out because, you know, you've got great programs like, you know, academic programs and athletic programs like Stanford that don't have a place. And uh, clearly, I think, you know, the spirit of athletic competition in, in college, you, you want a place for a school like Stanford. Coach, you've taken teams to a BCS title game in 2012, the CFP twice in 2018 and 2020. No doubt that's your goal every season to reach the CFP and, and ultimately win it. What are your expectations for this year's LSU team? Well, realistically, you know, we want to improve on, on the football team we put on the field last year. But, you know, make no mistake about it. This is still early in the process for us. We're, we're not... Um, developed as deep as Alabama or, or as Georgia, you know, the two-time national champion. We're going to take 15 true freshmen on our trip to Orlando. So, um, but look, you know, the, the, the bar here at LSU is about championships. And, and uh, I came down here uh, for that, that same reason. Uh, but we're going to have to do this over a longer period of time, uh, continue to build our program and have the realistic expectation that our football team is better than last year. And so when you measure that, you know, we played in the SEC West Championship last year. So people would naturally presume that, OK, you're going to take it one step further. Um, I'm looking at the development of our program in all facets. And the expectation is that this is a better football program in 2023. Coach, last question for you. I want to give you a minute to talk about your Kelly Cares Foundation. Uh, you do so much good work with that. Can you tell us what it is and what it does? Yeah, my wife and I, and she is um, really the the impetus behind our foundation. Um, my wife, Pocky, is a two-time cancer survivor. And, you know, when we were making our move from Grand Valley to Central Michigan, um, you know, we were just, you know, uh, a young couple with a, a young family and, trying to figure out how to put all this together. And, you know, we had this realization that, you know, we still had it better than anybody else. And um, she wanted to, to, to give back. And so we felt like, you know, in, in our life, um, you know, being a first responder was important to us. And if we could help others that, um, and she in particular uh, could tell her story about um, persevering through cancer twice and then, uh, obviously, we've been in different communities and, and making this will be our fifth move here to, to Baton Rouge, um, you know, be involved in communities. And then finally, you know, we've been at five different uh, educational institutes. Those three pillars, um, you know, cancer, uh, certainly uh, breast cancer and health, education and community were the pillars of this foundation, which we've raised uh, nearly six million dollars for and given back. So uh, it's been an incredible journey. We've had incredible people that have been uh, so important to us. And uh, we've been able to continue to, to, to grow the foundation down here in Baton Rouge from some generous um, uh, people. And uh, we look forward to continuing to grow the Kelly Cares Foundation uh, down here in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Well, congratulations, Coach, on all the great work you do with that. Thanks for joining us, Coach. We've known each other, I want to say, 20 years now at Cincinnati, yep. the Big East, and then in Notre Dame, when I was at Under Armour, we continued that. And I always had great admiration for you. Always root for you, Coach. And if for some reason I didn't root for you, I know I would never bet against you. So <laughs> good luck this weekend, uh, this Sunday against Florida State. And uh, good luck the entire season. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for having me on. And uh, look forward to uh, another great bowl season. Well, that'll do it for this week's podcast. If you missed any season one or two episodes, you can catch them on Spotify, Apple Music, in YouTube, or anywhere else you listen to your podcast. And if you enjoyed today's show, we'd appreciate you to like, subscribe, and drop a five-star rating. 
And as always, you can follow all the bowl season news on our website, bowlseason.com, and on social media at Bowl Season. Thanks for listening.